I'm CK. Tonight we're going to build a digital oscilloscope. The one I'm going to be building is from Kuman. I bought it from Amazon. The link will be in the description. However, this, this particular kit and style is rather ubiquitous across both Amazon and eBay and you can find it for varying prices from $15 to $25 and a bunch of distributors have built up the kit and made it. It's a decent little oscilloscope and for $20 if you don't have a full scale oscilloscope you definitely should get one of these. Even if you do have a full scale oscilloscope this is handy to have just lying around on your bench to do quick probes. It's not the most full featured of course. Uh, the sample rate's kind of low. There aren't, a, there aren't any math functions. It's only one input and so on and so forth and limited memory. But it's a handy little oscilloscope to just have on your workbench all the time. You don't have to drag out, in my case, you don't have to drag the oscilloscope cart over and get everything set up. So we'll put it together and see how she works. Hope you enjoy it. Here's the box and as I said I've built one of these before so I'm reasonably familiar with this. It's not it's not an easy build. Hold on, first we have to get rid of the box. It's not an uh, easy build so this is not a beginner kit. I would call it uh, moderate but the result that you get out of it uh, is well worth the effort and the price again for twenty dollars it's hard to beat let's look at hold on I gotta put my visor on I forgot again let's look at what we got in the bag we've got some paperwork So here's the full build. Now the pictures are only of the specific areas. It's not a full view of the board, but still it's got a lot of value. And uh, again, the board is relatively easy to put together. The other piece of paper is how to use it which is nice, and a calibration guide and explaining the triggers. So even if you want to end up with a much more powerful oscilloscope in the future, this is a good one to start with because you can get learn your chops. You can get uh, under, start understanding trigger modes, understanding how to set up the uh, voltage for increments on the screen, sensitivity, uh, how you cup, how it's coupling and be able, being able to snapshot a trace even though you can't pull it off but you can freeze it on screen uh, to do something, how to adjust the time base and all that. Now the specifications, here's where it kind of <coughs> falls down is it's a one meg sample rate which it kind of makes that, but the sample rate's not really high. Uh, the impedant input maximum input voltage is 200 volts peak, which is a little bit low, and the record length is only a thousand uh, points, or actually 1024. So it's and the time base goes down to 10 milliseconds, which is not bad. So this is a good little kit and a good little device, particularly as a starter oscilloscope. And it's fun to put together. <coughs> so the first thing you'll notice when you look at the board is it comes with one, two, three, uh, two circuit mount ICs already installed one power supply already installed, or voltage regulator already installed, a bunch of resistors already on the board. So it's got surface mount to give it some of the power to, uh, and the smarts in this to do what it does, but you don't have to mess with the surface mount components if you're not comfortable with that. This is the TFT display. I'm not going to take it out of its little bag yet. 
it comes with a probe. In this case, it's not a uh, hook type probe. It's just two alligator clips, but you can, since it's a standard BNC connector, you can hook any kind of probe up to it that you'd like. And it's got a calibrator for the probes themselves. And here's a bag of parts. Nothing too surprising in the bag of parts. The main thing that you'll find to be a pain is these two pin headers. They're, they're what connect the motherboard to the TFT display board, and they're just a bunch of pins. It's a bunch of tedious soldering. Another pin header, power connector, bunch of switches. These switches, now again, I've only got the, purchased the one from Kuman, and the switch quality is not great. It's not the best switches. Uh, other distributors might put higher quality switches in it, or they might put lower quality switches in it, so you never know. And here's the, you know, I haven't tried doing this. Uh, here's the chip, an 8 meg crystal, and I don't know if I could overclock this and it would do any, do any better. Or if I could get a higher... Oh, here's this current consumption. I'm sorry, I didn't even notice that. Power supply, 12 volt, 8 volt to 12 volt uh, range. And current consumption is about 120 milliamps. So that's not bad. That's, that's good. In fact, I'm thinking that I may mount this on some rails and have it in my uh, test Euro rack out here in the shop. But if I do that, I'll show it later. It's not the main point of the video today. So that's all the bits. Oh, also a bunch of little rubber feet if you want to go through here, even though I'd, I'd rather use these as mounting holes with screws or whatever. So I'm going to get the soldering iron heated up and we'll dive in. And this board is just barely big enough to justify the circuit board stand. And when I say justify, I mean, <coughs> excuse me, justify the irritation of using the circuit board stand. Two other things about the circuit board itself. It does not have the component values silk screened on it which is not great, but it does have through hole plating, which is great, so halfway good. So for the, that just means you have to keep the build guide around to know which goes where. Uh, the only thing I also don't have is I haven't looked up online to see if they have a build guide online, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not going to bother. First we're going to do all the resistors, and there's a bunch, there's a bunch of different values, so be careful as you go through the resistors and uh, ensure you get the right value in the right place. So what I'm going to do is go into fast motion, sort the resistors, put them all on, uh, and you'll watch that go, go by really quickly. Oops, and this stupid PCB didn't, holder didn't lock in again. Again, I hate these. Somebody has to come up with a better solution. You know what we need? All you bright lads and lassies out there watching this, instead of these stupid thumb screws, which you can't work really well because you're trying to apply compression to the board. We need a lever lock that applies a little bit of tension as you flip it over. Because then I could just put my hands here, lock it in, move the lever over. Please somebody build that.
that's all the resistors and as you probably noticed or may have noticed <coughs> at the beginning I was going to sort all the resistors and put them on the board in order. I didn't. I just put them all in a pile, picked one up, put it on the meter, placed it, picked one up, put it on the meter, placed it. Sometimes that's just faster. Now one thing I do want to point out is you will need uh, at least one leftover lead. There's a, uh, where is it? You put a jumper here, a little loop, and that's where uh, you hook your probe up to calibrate it. Uh, I'm not going to use a resistor lead for that. I'm going to use a diode lead because diode leads are, uh, let me grab a diode, because 58, uh, 59s, 58, 50s, uh, whatever's, uh, 5818s, the leads are thicker, and I want a thicker lead there if I'm going to be clicking, uh, clipping a probe to it every so often. Now we're going to do, oh, one other thing, I'm sorry. The resistors are kind of scattered around and they can be sometimes hard to find. And the other challenge is the ordering is somewhat funky. I look at this stack, for example. This is R14, R13, R10, R9, R11, R12. So be careful. Uh, don't think things are going to be in numeric order. Look at the actual silk, screen, silk screened numbers. Because if you don't, you'll run into... Uh, if you put the wrong resistor in the wrong place, you're going to get the wrong values on the screen when you're actually testing something. Now we've got uh, three in, uh, chokes or inductors, ten mi uh, 100 microhenries, and where are they? There's one. There they are. There's all three of them. They're all the same value, so makes it easier. Now, again, finding where they are is always the most fun. So this would be L1, and I often use this little trick. I take an index card and I block off part of the board so I'm just rolling along, uh, revealing things. I'm not overwhelmed by everything on the board all at once, uh, trying to find a particular component location. Come on, guys, where are you? Where? Are, oh, there they are. L1, L3, and L4. Of course, I could have looked for the little squiggly that indicates a choke or inductor, but I wasn't being that smart. Yes, I do use every last bit of solder. If you went through as much solder as I do, you would too. Actually, I'm going to take one of these choke leads and put that aside for our calibration loop because they're good and beefy, too. Now we do the two diodes. Where's my other diode? The little glass guy. Oh, no, it's not a little glass guy. Huh. I'm saving one more diode lead as well as the inductor lead. Uh, just out of paranoia. I'll put the 8 megahertz crystal in. Uh, they also include a USB socket. Uh, as they say, uh, this connector is optional. It's not used right now. I believe, though, that you can update the firmware on this if you want to. 
I've read that the firmware for this is in open source and you can uh, play with it if you want. Uh, I don't want to do that, so I'm going to leave the USB connector off. Now we have the four push buttons. I do wonder if I ever get to a thousand subscribers and I enter the lofty realms of being able to monetize. I wonder if I get demonetized for smoking a pipe while I'm working. I don't think so. I don't think I'm encouraging any activity. I'm just doing an activity. But have to get to a thousand subscribers before that even makes any difference at all. Uh, the other one of these I built, I had a little problem because uh, it took a little while to figure out I wasn't getting results I wanted on the screen and I hadn't I had one cold solder joint on one of these uh, switches. So, just good, good reminder that no matter how long you've been doing something, you can make mistakes. Okay, next is the ceramic caps. Uh, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna finish up for this evening before doing that. So. You won't notice it, but that's all for me for tonight. I gotta go feed the cats. And we'll dive back into this tomorrow night. Do you want treats? Do you want snacks? And now it's capacitor time. I'm gonna flip all these over. Okay, now we've got a bunch of pin headers to put on. And... I'm not, oh, you gotta cut them. I'm sorry, I was being lazy. Uh, and you don't really need them, they're pin headers here, which go here on J5 and J6 to do external uh, connections. And I'm not going to do that because I'm going to be lazy. So now we'll put the female connectors pin headers on there at J7 and J8. These two, which are going to support the LED, I mean LCD display. And as usual, with the pin header, I tack one leg down. And then it's all cattywampus, as you can see. It's all unperpendicular and so on, but it doesn't matter because I just heat up that one leg that I got in there. Make it perpendicular, which I didn't yet. Oh, that's there is something, some wildlife out there making a noise. I don't know what it is. I'm going to get up and go look. No, it's just a coyote. J7 
just barking faster than usual. Now you notice, by the way, uh, the J7 and J8 pin headers don't do anything. They're to support the display. So there are no traces coming off them. But it's nice that they have nice support for the display. That coyote really is barking weird. Oops, wrong solder. Pulled out the thick solder because I used uh, the thick solder on power connector because I wanted to glob a lot of solder onto the power connector since it's really important that it has a lot of structural stability for when you pull the connector in and out over the years. There's two places on this that you want to glob on the solder and that's the power connector and the BNC connector because both of those obviously are the ones you're going to be using the most. So I'm going to tack that leg right there and take a look. And we're flat on the board and we're perpendicular so I can solder all 20 hundred of uh, the rest of these pins on here. That's that pin header. <coughs> and I'll put the switches on board. And these switches are keyed uh, so you get them in the right order. Oh, one other thing I wanted to point out when you're doing these, these, this pin header set. There are two jumpers uh, that you want to make sure you don't bridge unintentionally. And while I was soldering the pin header, I mean the other stuff on the board, WKXR, the classical station I listen to when I'm in fast motion and you can't hear my sound, WKXR out of New York, uh, they have an app on the App Store. Uh, they're, in my opinion, the best classical music station in the world, and I've listened to all, almost all of them. Well, I have a, a Respigi uh, Violin Concerto world premiere. He never finished it, and his descendants just found a Spanish conductor, or Italian conductor, I'm sorry, a modern gentleman, who they gave the sketches that Respigi had written, and he wrote the rest. It sounds credible. Uh, these end pins on the switches, again, another place where you want to glob the solder on because they're where the mechanical force of you moving the switch back and forth will be primarily absorbed. Okay, the switches are all on. So the only thing we've got is we've got pin headers for the LCD display and the USB connector that we are not going to be using. Oh, and I'm sorry, one of the most important parts, the BNC connector. I gotta do that. Now this is a little more challenging because these pins, as you can see, are part of the housing and you're going to have to pump a lot of heat into it to get the solder to adhere. Again, and we want to make sure this is a good, strong mechanical connection. I'm going to let the 
pin rest in the crook of this 30 degree bend and then start getting some solder in there. You're obviously not going to hurt it. It's not an it's not a electronic component that's got anything that's going to be damaged by heat from an iron while you're soldering it. Let's make sure this. Connector's the one I'm most concerned about. I think this is strong enough. Of course, it got very hot. Yeah, seems to be strong enough. I'm not going to trim that uh, BNC long lead yet. I'll do that when I'm all done and I've actually tested this. Okay, now we create the little ring for calibration and testing. With one of the solder leads I kept. And I'll use my little bending tools, but you don't need to do that if you have just a pair of needle nose pliers or even your fingers really you can get a good bend on it. That should be a good bend. And I just put my fingers on the BNC connector and it's still warm. Come on. I'm going to use my locking pliers to keep the, I mean, locking tweezers to ensure I've got uh, enough length above the circuit board to do this because you can accidentally push the little wires you're working with too far down and then, or pull them in or whatever and then you don't have a good loop, but we've got a good loop there. So that's the main board all done. Switches all work. Buttons press well. BNC connector connects. Only thing left to do is uh, solder the pin headers on the TFT display and I will do that <coughs> tomorrow because the cat's got to eat. Now it's time to put the pin headers on the TFT display and we've got to cut two there and then we've got one pre-made for this end. Uh, these two are, as I mentioned earlier, I are simply for structural support. They're not conductive. This is what's talking to everything on the board. And because this is kind of uh, not all that interesting, I'm going to go to fast motion and talk to you in a minute. And there is one more piece of soldering to do on the main board. It, you're going to short a bridge. Junction point 2, JP2, and it's near transistor or JP3. And we're going to short this jumper right here. Just put a drop of solder on it to bridge the two contacts.
And I think I said JP3, I meant JP2. Kind of a big ball, but since the circuit board resists uh, solder so well, you have to kind of get excessive with that. And now we're going to mate. I'm going to take it out of the PCB holder. And we're going to mate the display with the capture board. Everything's looking good. All good. And that's the way it looks when it's done. I'll go ahead and put the probe on the top. Now, next thing we're going to do is get a power supply. Oh look, I've got a power supply right here. And this is a 9 volt unit. So we'll dial our little power supply into 9 volts. Roughly that. Come on down. Come on down. Nine point three, that'll have to be good enough. Uh, I need one more thing. I need a power connector. Let me go grab one. This is one that has a whole bunch of wire attached to it that I don't need right now, but it's the one that was handiest. As you'll notice, I've kept the protective film on the TFT display just because no reason other than I want to mess it up later rather than right now. So I'm clipping my leads on and we should get power up here in a second. And there's power. I'm going to turn my lamp off. And it's booting. It should be booting. I'll give it a reset. No, it's not actually doing anything. Why are you not doing anything? Oh, I have to do JP4 too. I'm sorry, I, I skipped a step. So, we're going to pull this back off anyway, so I'm going to short out J4 anyway, JP4, which is right there. I'm going to take the power off for a second, put all the pins back in, power up again. Booting. Yay! And there's the basic display. Let me see if I can zoom this in a little bit. Get my meter out of the way. So that's the way it looks. And again, we've got reset button to reboot it like that. Then selectors for auto, norm, single shot, where you're going to pick up the trigger. moving your uh, index lines up and down I'm sorry. oh yeah and here tells you now we're AC now we're DC can you see that yeah uh, and sensitivity which is changing 
the increments of the grid lines. There are two different ones, of course. So we're going to do a little calibration here. We're going to attach the probe to J1. I mean to J2. I'm getting that other piece of paper out. So, connect the red clip to the test signal terminal and leave the black clip, clip unconnected. Unconnected. So, like send at point 10 or point 1. And send 2 to X5, which we're at. Set couple to AC or DC. And there we've got a square wave. We'll do the time base to 2 milliseconds. Okay. So it wants us to turn the trimmers to get some good strong uh, right angles. But I don't think we really have a problem. Oh wait, we might. What we have a problem with is this screwdriver doesn't fit. Uh, I have to go get a smaller screwdriver to fit in that trimmer cap. Yeah, I remember what I needed to do there. I needed to get my iFixit set of screwdrivers and get the really tiny screwdriver out from the collection of bits. Really tiny. I'm actually going to change the time base. Okay. That looks much better. I don't know why it wants us to go to 0 0.2 milliseconds. We're doing okay, except we have a little bit of lead. A little bit of overshoot on that one. On the peaks, there we go. Oh, that's completely flat. Okay, so it's calibrated, which is good. So I'm going to disconnect that, and I'm going to do a little more sample testing. So I'm going to put my screwdriver away. And I'm going to do a little testing with this. This is a pocket size uh, tone generator, oscillator. So we can get some waveforms out of this audio style waveforms so we can play around and make sure this is all working well. So let me wire this up. And we'll be messing with the time bases and so on. I'm going to move this over. Slightly so you can see both of them, maybe. Yeah, that should work. I don't want to back off too much because I want you to see the screen up close. So let's turn on. Okay, something's happening. You can see it waving up and down, but that's a, a 10 hertz or 20 hertz signal. So what we want to do is we want to change our time base there. until we actually bring in a nice little sine wave. Might showing up on my silly camera. I can't tell if that's showing up, folks. I'm sorry. Uh, let me mess. There we go. So it's stable. And now we can change the waveform and we'll see how the display reacts. And now it's as it's supposed to be. It's a square wave. Back to sine wave. Let's change the frequency. So as you can see, it's a fine little oscilloscope. Let 
that you can do everything you'd expect to do with the basic functionalities of a scope. And one other thing, we'll do the one other thing, which is holding the waveform. Now that waveform's held, no matter what I do, it doesn't change. Uh, and you can analyze it, you can look at it, you can use that to look at some other part of the circuit and see what's going on, and to release it, you just press the button again. So as you can see, it's for what it is, and they don't advertise it to be anything more than what it is, it's a basic, very basic oscilloscope that you can just have on your desktop or your workbench. So it's really handy. Uh, I often uh, grab this as well as this. When, uh, as well as my waveform analyzer or waveform generator when I'm working on a guitar amp <clears throat> to follow a signal through and see what it's doing uh, if I can't figure out what's wrong with it. So this, which is really handy, and this, again, this was like 15 bucks. This is $20. Grab one of these, put it together. You'll have a uh, Working oscilloscope, if you can't afford one that's a couple of hundred dollars or more, this will at least get you started and get you into learning how to use a scope. So I highly recommend this. Again, I'll put the link to the one I bought on Amazon, but there are quite a few of these around on Amazon and eBay with the same basic board layout and uh, software inside. So grab any of them. They run from $15 to $25. Best $15, $25 electronic workbench investment you'll make. Hope you enjoyed the video and see you next time.